Someone's using the microwave, apparently. That destroys my Wi-Fi. I don't know why. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Lithography. Crams are here with Joe and Jason, and we are going to tackle the lithography of a monumental band in classic rock history. Pink Floyd, pioneers of progressive and experimental rock. A couple of major albums that were done in the studio that pushed rock in a certain direction, kind of polarizing at times their lists. Um, they've got a couple of huge albums that some consider number one. So we're going to dive into that. Kind of a tough discography to do because in my opinion, there's like, there's 15 total. I would say nine of them are Pink Floyd albums. A few are David Gilmour albums. A few are uh, Roger Waters album. Maybe there's a Rich Wright album in there somewhere. Maybe the first two are Sid Barrett albums. Um, so we'll get into that. Um, anything to add, Joe? Well, yeah, I mean, Pink Floyd, like, I, I think people maybe don't recognize how huge they are. There was one one guy basically looked at, like, actual number of discs sold, and Pink Floyd was number one. They were ahead of the Beatles. And this, this kind of separate than, like, the sound scan stuff that everybody uses. But, I mean, Pink Floyd's one of the biggest bands of all time. Uh, Dark Side of the Moon spent 950 weeks on the Billboard 200. It's, it's been on there forever. The Wall is one of the biggest album sellers of all time. Every one of their albums was at least top 10 in Britain you know, from, from the very beginning. It's 15 straight albums, a bunch of number ones. And I mean, it's such a weird history because you have the Sid Barrett years and then he completely disappears. They carry on, they bring in David Gilmour and they gain popularity, you know, up until Dark Side of the Moon. And then Roger Waters kind of takes over the band. You know, in the beginning, it was really kind of a collaboration between all of them. And, you know, Roger Waters has lots of detractors kind of for what he did to Pink Floyd. He basically scared off Richard Wright and Nick Mason and made David Gilmour a bit player in the band. And then he quit and they became even more popular. Uh, giant tours all over the country all over the world. So it's, it's a really kind of a lot of infighting, a lot of drama in the band from the different lead singers and just a really kind of cool, long history. There's not many bands with their amount of drama and um, kind of changes. They're, they really didn't stay static at all. There's just a ton of changes. And it's uh, made for a real interesting discography, for sure. There's stuff I hadn't really ever listened to before. And I, I guess I had no idea that there was so much just all over the place. And it's just, it was, I don't know, it was, it was a cool lesson for me going beyond the big kind of four albums. Anything to add, Jason? Or do you want to just kick it off with your worst of Pink Floyd? Pink Floyd, never like one of my top favorite bands, but they're kind of unavoidable, kind of omnipresent in culture and on classic rock radio. And of course, in high school, you know, I had a little bit of a, Pink Floyd phase got really into Dark Side and, and stuff like that. I've heard all these records at least once before, but a lot of them I never really got into. And so going through them all consecutively, like Joe, was was pretty interesting to do them in order all within a week of each other. And heading into this, I really had no idea what my list would end up looking like. Pretty much everything was up for grabs, I guess. So I'll get it started at the bottom, number 15, for me is gonna be Amagama. So it starts out with a, a live, some live recordings, and then there's, you know, it's a studio album attached to it as well. I really only considered the studio tracks when ranking this. I mean, maybe some people rank this a little higher because of the, the live record part of it. I guess it was uh, Richard Wright's idea to each like sort of take a part of the record and make basically make it like their own little solo project that they had total control over and very very little of it works there's a few interesting tracks Grandchester Meadow is one of Roger Waters tracks that one's okay part three of the narrow way by David Gilmore is is kind of decent but the Richard Wright Sisyphus is really hard to get through and the Nick Mason stuff is is tough as well uh yeah there's maybe out of this whole long record there's maybe a few minutes that are enjoyable but it's kind of a slog yeah i'd never heard this one before and whew, uh 
Mama Gama is my 15, and it is the worst record I've ever had to listen to all the way through. I would never have made it through if we weren't doing this. I had no idea what I was in for. It's just atmospheric noodling, all the ambient noises. Just, I hate it so much. I mean, literally, there's like two minutes of the Narrow Way Part 3 that resemble an actual song. The um, the one about rodents grooving in a cave with a pick or whatever. I mean, I really just wanted to turn it off and just stop there. It's the worst album I think I've ever heard. And I would be surprised if there was an album from a band, I mean, maybe not ever, but from a band with the stature of Pink Floyd to make something like that, especially after, I mean, it's not like this was their first foray into this kind of stuff. They had already made a couple of good albums. So this kind of, in there just ugh, i hated it i agree i've got umagama at number 15 it's a lot of nonsense it's sort of crazy for the sake of being crazy at times there's no motivation or vision i don't understand like jason said the idea to segregate the album into solo works with virtually no input from anyone else. Um, And it is, I hate using the word, but it is pretty pretentious. I think I took less out of it than even Jason. I won't even give it a few minutes of decency. This is the only one I can firmly say it's a strong dislike of their discography. So number 15, it is official. All right. Uh, Number 14. I will say before going any further that my list, I do not think is what most people would consider the standard Pink Floyd ranking. So just preparing everybody for that. Number 14 for me is going to be Piper at the Gates of Dawn. Not a big fan of the Sid Barrett era in general. It's a little too psychedelic for my taste. Um, There are moments within that era where he has a little bit more melody and sort of like this childlike wonder. Tracks like See Emily Play and Bike. That's the kind of Sid Barrett stuff that I like. And you don't really get much of that until the last four tracks of Piper with the Gnome, Bike, Chapter 24, The Scarecrow. But everything before that on this record is just a little too psychedelic, a little too trippy, a little too dissonant. And I don't know, it's just not that engaging for me. I know a lot of people love this. I know it's like a landmark album in psych rock, but it's just not my cup of tea, really. I don't, I don't totally disagree with you on that one, Jason. It's not one of my favorites. But before we get to that, for me, I have Endless River is my number 14. Kind of just on principle that, you know, it doesn't really feel like an album because it's not an album. It's just a bunch of old takes and old kind of demos that they piece together into an album kind of to honor Richard Wright, who passed away in 2008. And there's, I mean, there's plenty of cool moments on it, but it just doesn't feel like an album to me. It doesn't, there's nothing substantial. It's not really, you know, there's no real point to it. And I think in their discography, it's, um, you know, it's pretty, but kind of pointless as an app album itself yeah endless river it's it's nice it's not anywhere near amagama um but it's just kind of endless and pointless a little bit 14 is going to be more this is another kind of soundtrack album it's um much less interesting than the first two i think and it's definitely more interesting than amagama they're not pink floyd that we know and love yet but you're starting to get some signs of it, like um, in the Nile song, I think it comes out, especially with kind of like this, the really operatic screaming. I did like Cymbeline and um, Green is the Color, but other than that, I think it kind of blends in with the first set of albums with that more psychedelic sound, not as much as the Sid Barrett version. Not t- not terrible, but not very good. Number 14, more. Uh, my number 13 is going to be Endless River pretty much agree with Joe. It's, I don't know, when this first came out, I I was pretty excited for it, being a a pretty big fan of the Division Bell, and knowing that these tracks were kind of like recorded at the same time, and it was billed as like a, another studio album, and every review of it that I read was, was pretty glowing, and none of them even mentioned the fact that it was an instrumental album. I mean, you get one song with with vocals, but I think if you're writing a review on this record, you would mention that it's mostly instrumental. And so to me, it it just kind of felt like a PR move. They were like trying to pull the wool over people's eyes and sell it as a studio album, when in fact it was just an outtakes album. I don't know, that left a bad taste in my mouth and I've 
never really forgiven them for that. So that's sitting at number 13 for me. Uh, yeah, I've, I've kind of forgot to mention that in my little spiel that, yeah, it's there's like no words. So that definitely does not help its case. For me, number 13, I have more, which is like half instrumentals. And the tracks that they do kind of rock out on, like the Nile song, Abusa Bar, some interesting stuff there. It doesn't sound much like their first two albums. Cymbaline is kind of a cool, pretty little ballad, but it's a film soundtrack. So you have all that kind of filler, those little noodly pieces. And it doesn't seem like it's, I've never seen the movie, but it doesn't seem very exciting. I would like less of more, please. Well said. I've got The Endless River at number 13. It's too long. It's too much. It is pleasant sounding enough. I mean, you've got Gilmore just kind of showcasing his guitar t- tones, and there are not a lot of lyrics, like you said. You know, it's it's got that flavor that a momentary lapse of reason has, and after that, kind of stuck with the, the Gilmore led Pink Floyd. I don't know if they're trying to be psychedelic or not, but, you know, if, if it's just instrument instrumental in nature, but it doesn't have a lot of meaning behind it. It's just kind of a big fluff piece and it sounds fine, but nothing, uh, nothing really noteworthy here. Number 12 for me is more. There are a lot of tracks on here that I like, actually. I like Nile Song, one, probably one of their most rocking songs in their catalog. It's got a really cool fuzzed out guitar solo. Crying songs, cool. Green is the color. The problem is there's too many tracks like party sequence and main theme that just kind of break up the the flow of the record. I think if they took some of these tracks and, you know, maybe wrote a couple more good ones and left off all the sort of soundtrack interludes, it would, it would be a lot better. But I do think it's better than Piper for that reason. I think there are some good tracks here that I like more than anything on that record. Okay, so we're, we're pretty much all in kind of the same realm here because I have at my number 12 uh, also Piper at the Gates of Dawn like Jason I don't really get it I remember reading reviews and kind of things about it saying it's this big huge landmark you know it it made the Rolling Stones top 500 albums of all time most reviews give it like five stars And so I listened to it and I was just not blown away at all. Not really what I was expecting. Even the kind of psychedelic elements are just underdeveloped. It's not my idea of good psychedelic music. I like kind of the interesting little childlike curios like Bike and The Gnome and Lucifer Sam, Matilda Mother, kind of the little interesting little studies of characters but the the longer you know interstellar overdrive doesn't do anything for me i guess i'm not a big sid barrett fan kind of glad that he went crazy and left the band because it led to to much better things so yeah piper the gates of dawn kind of a disappointment for me just don't don't get this one really my number 12 is going to be Kind of where I make my cutoff point. I think the bottom three albums are ones that I consider lousy or not so good. I like 12 on up, not in the same level. I think they will have really great albums later. This one is just pretty good. Saucer full of secrets. It's got that really nice, charming British psychedelic experimental rock. It's not quite as good as Piper, in my opinion, so I disagree with you guys there. It's got some really cool elements on here, like the childlike atmosphere isn't quite as much on Piper, but I think there's a little more well-rounded stuff which um, I don't enjoy quite as much as Piper, but we'll get into that then. I really like Let There Be More Light. Jug Hand Blues is pretty good. Um, they're just not really standing out yet as a group for me, um, given all of the other kind of psychedelic stuff that's going on at the time. This one kind of seems like Richard Wright is kind of the highlight on this one too. I and mean, I very much prefer Waters being the, the main vision of the group. So number 12 saucer full of secrets that is my number 11 i think this is a lot better than piper at the gates of dawn much more tuneful much more well produced less sort of just meandering noodling less dissonance you know this is the first record with david gilmore on it and i think his presence is immediately felt i like tracks like let there be more light remember a day seesaw i found this to be uh, quite enjoyable but not, not among their best. Um, all right. Well, uh, my number 11, and be interesting to see where you guys put this one, is going to be Adam Hart Mother. I know some people really like this one. And the first time I listened to it, I really hated it. And then I kind of came back to it. And I, I kind of enjoyed it the second time through. Adam Hart Mother, the song itself, is pretty good. 
There's some pretty interesting textures in there. Gilmore is kind of discovering his his tone and his guitar style a little bit more. He kind of a little anonymous before this, but I think it's a lot better. And I like the three middle songs, If Summer 68, That Old Sun, all by different members of the group. And they all kind of have their own little flavor. If is kind of like Roger Waters beginning to find his voice a little bit. Uh, Summer 68 is, is Richard Wright's. It's just a kind of pretty tune about a groupie, I think. And then Fat Old Son's got some cool stuff by Gilmore. Again, his, his guitar tone and voice and phrasing kind of starting to come together. Kind of sounds like a traffic song, which is kind of what I like my psychedelia to sound like. And then Alan's Psychedelic Breakfast is, you know, it's, it's not great. I think actually this album itself would make a much better film soundtrack than the two film soundtracks that they actually did. So it's kind of a, it's a cool album. I liked it. I like the cover by Hypnosis of the Cow, but not, I mean, they're still kind of not the Pink Floyd that I want them to sound like. Adam Hartmother, number 11. Speaking before about me preferring the vision of Waters as the main input of the band brings me to my number 11, which is going to be the final cut. Sort of the stepsister to the wall, leftovers, some original stuff to, you know, kind of his big anti-war album. It's not so subtle. There's not like the symbolism in the story that the wall has, but I do really like kind of the Maggie Thatcher confrontation that he has throughout it. Really nice, rich sonic sound to it, very similar to the wall. However, it is desperately needing Nick Mason or a drummer. There's very little drum work on it. It's very subdued, kind of plays very stale because of that. And really, a lot of the stuff just doesn't hold a candle to the wall. I do kind of like some moments, like when the Tigers broke free, Heroes Return. Yeah, I mean, it's got all those really nice sounds and textures that the wall has, but it's just The Ugly Cousin, it's just not the same. All right, my number 10 is going to be A Momentary Lapse of Reason. It's not bad. There's a lot of good tracks on it. You know, this is the first one without Roger Waters. Some of the production I'm not crazy about. A little too 80s sounding for me. And I I feel like on this record, it feels like Roger Waters is really kind of needed and missing. Where on the division bell, it, it feels like a vision, like David Gilmore's vision and being well executed and like a complete product here, it feels like second rate Floyd a little bit. That said, there's still, you know, some great tracks like On the Turning Away and Learning to Fly, the big hits that you hear all the time on the radio. And there's some great guitar playing as well. So it's a, it's a good record. It's just not great. Also, my number 10, uh, Momentary Last of Reason. This was when uh, Roger Waters quit the band. He basically yelled and denigrated Nick Mason and Richard Wright to the point where they couldn't even play anymore. Nick Mason, I don't even think he plays most of the tracks on drums. Richard Wright basically had to be like forced to come back. Not forced, but convinced to come back and join the band. So most of the the synths on here aren't him. So it's pretty much just David Gilmore kind of trying to sound like Pink Floyd, I think, sort of. There's a little too much of that like ambient noise and instrumental stuff. But when they, when he actually like puts some songs together, I think they're really good. One Slip on the Turning Away, you know, pretty much the first half of the album's pretty strong. Uh, some really nice you know, guitar work, kind of what was missing from the final cut. If you could combine the final cut in Momentary Lapse of Reason and just like put them together, I think it would be a great album. Dave Gilmore, not the greatest songwriter, I don't think, vocally or um, lyrically. That presence of Roger Waters is definitely missing here. You know, it's a David Gilmore solo album is basically what it is. And it's pretty good, but it's just not kind of that's it's not Pink Floyd. I have many of the same feelings about Division Bell and Momentary Lapse of Reason as those, but I my favoritism is switched between the two. My number 10 is Division Bell. I don't think it's as good as Momentary Lapse of Reason. And the main reason is I think it has a much poorer rhythm section. I don't think it has a lot of good musical elements outside of the guitar work. That said, the guitar work on Division Bell is just an extravaganza of how good and how much feel Gilmore has and his tone is remarkable even though sometimes his tone without Waters has that kind of like soft core porn element to it when he's soloing but it sounds good I love High Hopes I love Pulls Apart especially the little slide on it to take it back it sounds great it's very melodic 
uh, more melodic, I would say, than momentary lapse of reason, especially with the guitar interludes and the interplay. But he's desperately missing Waters as the the songwriter here. He's not a good songwriter. And I don't think, I think this is a weaker songwriting effort on Gilmore's part than Momentary Lapse of Reason. So I disagree with you guys there. I do enjoy the Division Bell, but not as much as Momentary Lapse of Reason or eight other albums. So number 10, Division Bell. My number nine is going to be Adam Hart Mother. So this is where the sort of classic sound of Floyd starts to emerge and become a little bit recognizable like joe said there's sort of three middle tracks if summer 68 and fat old son i think are the best on the record title tracks pretty good as well but yeah there's just better records i think although i do like this one all right uh my number nine is going to be another film soundtrack uh, obscured by clouds and they kind of were actually writing this they put this together as they were writing Dark Side of the Moon. So it kind of feels like unfinished, sort of like their B material to, to what they put together. It kind of, you know, I think it's missing a unifying theme here. But there are some some good songs on here. When You're In uh, has this kind of cream-esque sound. This is this kind of, there's more blues, I think, on this album than in any of their other albums the gold it's in the hills is kind of the same thing it's this kind of upbeat kind of rocker which you really haven't seen from them before the song's a little shorter three four kind of has this cool like recurring kind of synth or something like big guitar after like every phrase kind of interesting there's like a simple ballad in here even so it's it's got kind of all the elements and it's sort of I feel like it's kind of an outlier in their discography. But again, I think it's weighed down by too many instrumentals and they kind of need a, a theme to kind of build off of. It's it's still kind of like all over the place a little bit. But it's 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 kind of a cool album. It's one of the ones I, I think I missed in my first, you know, like listen through. I never really heard this one. So it, it definitely has some elements that I didn't think Pink Floyd was really capable of. Kind of shows their breadth and depth and they're not just sort of a, a prog rock band. Well said. I'll get to that shortly, but I agree with pretty much everything you had to say. My number nine is going to be Piper at the Gates of Dawn. I like it a lot. You know, it's not the Pink Floyd. My favorite Pink Floyd is going to be essentially from Adam Hardmother through the wall. I think that's the sound and I think that's them totally unified and that's what I love. But I do think this one is good all the way through and it's rounded out really well. And if they would have kept down this path with Sid Barrett and it would have worked out pretty well, it would have been cool to see how they grew with that. I like the childlike nature, but I think there's a kind of almost like mm, haunting submersive element, subversive element to it, which kind of makes it more interesting as you kind of trip through that rabbit hole. It's this, you know, big grand inventive psychedelic space music. Love the opener. Love Lucifer Sam has this really cool like English secret agent feel to it. Matilda Mother's great. I like take up by uh, stethoscope and walk. It's it's really good all the way through. Like I said, they just became something else other than this album, which trumps this one. So but Piper at the Gates of Dawn I think is really good. All right. This is where my list I warned you people. Probably our paths diverge here. My number eight is Wish You Were Here. Um, for me, Shine On You Crazy Diamond is great, but I don't really like Welcome to the Machine. Have a Cigar is just okay. And I wouldn't mind never hearing the title track again. The recording lacks a little bit of the magic that Dark Side has. For me, it's, it's not quite as immersive as an experience. And so really this record just is one, one long track that I like a lot and the rest that I really don't really ever need to hear again. So as good as Shine On You Crazy Diamond is, it's only good enough to put it at number eight. Jason, we're, we're trying to get viewers here, man. What are you doing? <laughs> Unforgivable. Have a cigar, not great. Yeah, what? Have you ever, like, listened? <laughs> get out of here. Well, let's get back to the list here. Um, we'll have plenty more time to talk about how bad Jason is at ranking Pink Floyd later. Uh, for me, I got number eight, Saucer Full of Secrets. I think it's a step up from the debut. I like it. There's definitely more tunefulness. There's less psychedelia. I think the songs are just tighter. Sid Barrett only has one song on here that he contributed to, and that's Jug Band Blues. And the rest are 
it's Richard Wa uh, Richard Wright and, and Roger Waters kind of show here. But I think Gilmore definitely kind of adds flavor and, and tone to it. You know, his vocals, I think, are a step up from everyone else's in the band kind of even immediately. And there's some, some cool stuff here. I like Corporal Clegg, kind of anti-war. Uh, Let There Be More Light, kind of a cool, just very tuneful sort of psychedelia, uh, kind of like... Roger Waters was kind of trying to continue down the path that Sid Barrett started. And then Seesaw is kind of this, you know, similar to some of the the weirder kind of real British-y tracks of Piper at the Gates of Dawn, kind of that childlikeness coming through. And it's, you know, it's 38 minutes. There's no, there's, I guess, Sauce of Flow Secrets. It's about 12 minutes of the album. So it's sort of slight. It's got some cool sounds and I like it. And I liked it more the more I listened to it. My number eight is Obscured by Clouds. I think this is kind of the hidden gem in their catalog. I think it's a little underappreciated. It sounds great. The thing I like about it is, and it might just be because of the reality that I had to dive into this whole catalog. And Pink Floyd, it, most of their albums are not an easy listen. This one is pretty casual. It's simple, it's short, doesn't have a, a huge concept behind it. I think a lot of a lot of their stuff, there's always that kind of rumor that they were always trying to do a soundtrack for Stanley Kubrick. And I think that kind of plays off of what he is as like a filmmaker. It's really hard to kind of pinpoint some of the uh, ideas that come across in a Pink Floyd album. A lot of people interpret them differently. But this one doesn't have a lot of those elements. And it, it, it's really nice to just kind of just enjoy their playing, which I think is what happens. There's really nice, like, relaxed, jazzy nature that's going to prelude um, Dark Side. And then Gilmore has some of his more underrated stuff on here. Really nice sedated playing, like on Burning Bridges, but then he turns it up for uh, the gold. It's in the dot, dot, dot. And it is it is kind of that, you know, stretching stretching out and getting ready for Dark Side, um, especially like Mud Men is almost just sounds like a warm up for Dark Side, like what they would play at the sound check for that whole album. Free Four is really good. Just missed my top 10 songs. Um, but it's a very just enjoyable, casual listen and Obscured by Clouds doesn't get enough love. Number eight. I agree that it doesn't get enough love. And that's why it's higher on my list. At number seven for me, I've got Division Bell. When I went through the sort of Pink Floyd phase in high school, this was actually my favorite Pink Floyd record. Coming into this uh, exercise in the sort of deep dive. I, I I knew that it wasn't going to be number one anymore, but I still really like this record. I think David Gilmore's playing on it is fantastic. I think the songwriting is better than on Momentary Lapse of Reason, and I think it's just really consistent throughout. I, I don't think there's really any lulls in this record. So yeah, I think it's I think it's very good. I do remember in our younger years when you told me The Division Bell is your favorite Pink Floyd album, and that's when our friendship was really kind of budding. And I had to look in the mirror one night and be like, do I really want to be friends with this guy? <laughs> uh, well, let's let's keep The Division Bell talk going because it's also my number seven. I agree with it, what Jason said. The songwriting's better. He actually had his girlfriend help him with a bunch of songs at the time. So that might be where the, where the lyrics kind of up themselves. He also takes a lot of shots or, you know, some shots. At, at Roger Waters here and that kind of, you know, I like that kind of bitter, bracing kind of lyricals, you know. I think he was a little too nice maybe on Momentary Lapse of Reason and here he's kind of taking shots at, at well-deserved shots at Roger Waters. Richard Wright's kind of back. There's more keys. I think they sound better. Nick Mason's drums better. The sound is, is more varied. There's no like really kind of jarringly bad tracks. I think they're all pretty solid all the way through. Maybe a little too close to U2 in, in some spots, which is sort of too nice sounding, which is a little more grit, a little more kind of that meanness in the in the music as well. What Do You Want From Me is pretty awesome though, as far as like a, a showcase for, for David Gilmore's playing. Yeah, I mean, it's just a, it's a good album. It's a solid album. I don't know how like Pink Floyd it really is, but as far as, you know, if you consider this a David Gilmore album, it, it's very good, I think. Speaking of that, David Gilmore albums, my number seven is A Momentary Lapse of Reason. Everything you guys said about it is true, but I like the consequences of that. It's it's production to the excess. It sounds, it's trying to be so kind of cool and like it, like it's trying to score like the Mi a Miami Vice or something like that. It's really frosty sounding, but the guitar work is just awesome. It's much more alive than the Division Bell. I think the Division Bell is just kind of subdued and mellow and tired and this one is 
you know, very, very much has a lot of energy behind it. I love one slip, love on the turning away. Learning to fly is great. I like, I even like yet another movie. I like uh, Sorrow a good bit. I think there's just a lot of really cool excess 80s production on it. And it matches Gilmore's guitar. It's not a traditional Pink Floyd album, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't enjoy 90% of this album a good deal. And I can't remember, I think On the Turning Away made my top 10 songs list. We'll reveal that later. But I did have a lot of these, especially um, the ones that I just mentioned in my head for like a top 20, top 20, top 25 that I had to edit down. So because of that, and it might just be the production and the playing, maybe not the actual songwriting, but I think the songs are better than The Division Bell. All right, my number six is going to be The Final Cut. I actually like this record a lot. It's pretty much a Roger Waters solo effort, like you said. Probably the the biggest emphasis on lyrics that any Pink Floyd album has. It's really the centerpiece of the record. But I mean, it's, it's good musically as well. There's some great guitar solos. I think some of the guitar solos on this record actually stack up very well against even the best prior Gilmore solos, Comfortably Numb, or or whatever you consider the best Gilmore solo. The solos on um, Your Possible Pass and Fletcher Memorial Home are amazing. I love the sax playing on The Gunner's Dream as well. just think it's overall a very good record. And I I mean, it may not be like a unified band, but I still think the songs are good. So final cut, number six. Number six and Better Than Wish You Were Here. Yes. Well, it's not better than Wish You Were Here, that's a given, but the final cut is also my number six, and I think it's, maybe it just gets like left out because it came after the wall, and it is kind of Roger Waters, his show, but I do like it, and I like it because it is so different, the instrumentation is so different, there's almost no David Gilmore on it except for the solos, which like Jason said are exceptional. It really might be his his best work, maybe not my favorite, it might be like my second favorite as far as like albums with David Gilmore solos on it. Like Jason said, Your Possible Past, Fletcher Memorial Home, Not Now John, the final cut all have just these incredible shows that sound like nothing that you've really ever heard before. They're so kind of dark and explosive. It's just awesome stuff. And I wish my only real criticism of the album is there was a little more David Gilmour, maybe a little more David Gilmour lead vocals as well. I think Roger Waters is a competent vocalist, but he, he doesn't have a big range. He kind of has to stay in his his zone or it, he kind of gets in trouble. But I think the lyrics are really good. The anti-war sentiment kind of throughout the album, really strong, really vivid and uh, memorable lyrics, especially on something like Two Sons in the Sunset. I, I thought I hated this album when I was listening to these again. I thought like, oh, that, that Roger Waters, he ruined the whole band. But it, no, it's a good album. It's just different. It's not the Pink Floyd that maybe people wanted to hear after the wall uh, but it, it's a really solid entry in their their catalog yeah you you both make some really good points about it maybe i should have had it higher because i do enjoy it listening to but you know i can't help comparing it to the wall it's like having a chipotle next to a taco bell and obviously you're gonna go to the chipotle so i don't like that's just where i kind of stand with it number six for me is gonna be adam hart mother i think this is the album where they really find themselves as writers as conceptually what they want to be as a band as as players, this is where Gilmore really starts to find his sound, and not just his sound, but his place in the band. You know, the title track is awesome. It's epic and proggy. They've got a lot of those really good long songs, and this is one of the top three of them for me. Um, one of their just like symphonic masterpieces. Um, a little bit of new ground. They're also kind of perfecting some of the old ground. It's a really good gel of them playing as a band, but also kind of like Joe was saying, everyone's kind of got their input as well. Um, it's not a complete unified vision, but they're starting to really, really find themselves in that regard. I love title track i love if summer 68 fat old son are great not crazy about alan's psychedelic breakfast i wish it was better or something else was on there um because it's hard even though you know adam hart mother takes up 20 minutes of it or whatever it is you know having five tracks and disliking one of them is tough but i think as a whole it's a pretty darn good album and really important for their timeline as well all right number five for me is going to be metal really like this album a lot probably the 
the first album in their timeline that I would describe as really good, even though I would say Adam Hart Mother is pretty good. This one is really good. One of These Days is a great opener. And then you've got sort of a, a triptych of great tracks following it with A Pillow of Winds, Fearless, and San Tropez. And then, of course, you've got the, the epic at the end with Echoes. I think start to finish, it's very solid. It's another step further in perfecting their sound after Adam Hart Mother. And yeah, I think it's really, really strong throughout. Yes, Jason, you nailed it again. I, we're basically in lockstep other than that weird thing about Wish You Were Here. Because number five for me is also metal. And it's it's like just below like dark side as far as them like finding their sound. I think, again, kind of the lack of a unifying theme where they can kind of concentrate around one thing is the only thing that holds it back from being like, you know, in the upper echelon, the top four. And it's, it's a hard, you know, it's a high bar to clear to break into it. The opener one of these days really sounds like kind of classic Pink Floyd. It's got that big synth kind of scary sounding, uh, you know, real kind of gallopy bass. I think Roger Waters underrated as far as a bass player he kind of starts to use it more as an instrument starting with metal this kind of like groovy sound of this album too it's not quite as spacey you know as dark side or anything like that i mean there's some elements that almost sound like led zeppelin three ish sort of like a folk a little you know more acoustic guitar san tropez is real kind of laid back it doesn't sound like anything else in their catalog and then echoes for being 23 minutes long or whatever it is you don't like lose the the plot there's no like parts where you just like okay this is too long it's too much it really kind of carries the music all the way through which is pretty impressive for something that long and it's you know it's the precursor to, to dark side it's they're almost there and they'll, they'll get there it's a, a strong strong entry in the catalog for sure totally agree Metal is number five. You guys are both right. Jason, you're perfectly saying Adam Hart Mother is pretty good. This one's very good. And they're kind of expanding and getting a little more experimental playing off what they were doing with Adam Hart Mother. I mean, they've really mastered their sound and they're starting to play a lot more brash, like Joe was saying. Um, the bass and especially Gilmore is really taking over that sort of tour de force mystique with the guitar, really just kind of running away with it and not missing a beat. Um, the sound is there. This is the Pink Floyd sound, like Joe was saying. You hear it right off the bat with one of these days. Fearless is awesome. I'm not crazy about the vocals on San Tropez, but really that's one of the only flaws I have in the whole album. Echoes is I'm an epic masterpiece. I mean, you guys said it. It's, it's fantastic start to finish. So they've got four better ones, but it's a pretty good spot to kick off the top five. All right. Number four for me is going to be The Wall. Coming into this, I thought I was going to have this a lot lower. I always thought that this record was super overrated. I'm not super crazy about a lot of the radio hits from this record but this time through i really enjoyed it i think all of those tracks that had kind of grown stale with me work much much better within the context of the record and just start to finish i think it's you know really engaging the whole way through it's musically interesting conceptually interesting lyrically interesting and definitely a record that i think works better as a whole than than broken into into pieces i don't really ever want to hear another brick in the wall again on the radio but taken as part of the whole album it, it works yeah also my number four the wall again jason we're just in lockstep here i love it i think I mean, it's probably it's definitely in my top 100 albums of all time so just because it's at number four on this list i mean it no disrespect because it's just awesome from the opener in the flesh the sound you know richard wright's key keyboards and synths just sounds so incredibly good. I think it's maybe, even though he got fired halfway through this album by the dictator Roger Waters, he stayed on as a session player, and that's good because, I mean, his his sound from the opening in the flesh all the way through is just amazing. It might be the highlight of the whole album for me. But I love it because it, you know, it has a unifying concept like their last three albums. And you get those little refrains that kind of pop up you know, in the flesh, question mark, segues, you know, into side four, disc two, there's in the flesh, and it kind of repeats some of the, the same uh, music kind of note for note, but then changes it up. And you have that, you know, another brick in the wall, that kind of musical theme popping up in three or four different spots. And I, I like that kind of unified concept 
the lyrics are great. I think Roger Waters singing is good on this. I like the way he and, and Gilmore kind of even on the same tracks will do verses and choruses separately and then together and it just all works. Gilmore's guitar playing is incredible. And there's there's little pieces like one of my turns, I think is a good kind of proxy for the whole album. There's a minute or so of just kind of like spoken kind of ambient textures and noises. And then it kind of just explodes into this incredibly cool sounding, completely unique to Pink Floyd, like upbeat kind of rocker. And the same with something like The Show Must Go On, where it's just sort of laid back and stripped down. And then all of a sudden, all these vocals come in and it's sort of like this doo-wop thing and ends with this beautiful four-part harmony. All the little kind of elements and textures on top of the, you know, the classic cuts, uh, Comfortably Numb, Hey You, Run Like Hell. It all works so well. I love kind of the trial of the, the sort of the ending of the, the song where it kind of all comes together with the ridiculous voices and the orchestration. Great job by, by Bob Ezrin, who worked with Alice Cooper to kind of, you know, over the topness, he, he kind of knows how to do that. And I think it all kind of just works really well. It's just a, a brilliant album top 100 but there's just a couple i like more well put i think we are only in brilliant album territory now my number four is going to be animals which i really dig i didn't really like it growing up because i didn't really get it i hadn't read animal farm and you know it didn't make as much sense as the other stuff or the hits but i love it i think you previously described this album joe as very mean spirited and i think that's so correct and it's really political it's obviously orwellian um it's ruthless the guitar work is really fierce and intimidating i think intimidating is like this whole album is you're just like in awe you're like okay okay like whatever just i agree yes it's like this epic just critique of capitalism the sheep finally kind of have their day but there's some really nice understated bluesy elements like during pigs you know the guitar work is great i compare it a lot to the wall because it's this giant kind of like literary concept i don't think it kind of matches the mastery of the wall. And then I think a lot of that is just because it is so obviously derivative of Orwell and it's, you know, nothing terribly wrong with that. But I think the wall is just a little bit more creative and original. But Animals is awesome. There's really not a dull moment on it. And I just think some of the other albums are a little bit more impressive. And Jason, you were describing the last album you talked about with the big I word, interesting. And that's kind of why I have trouble placing Pink Floyd and how I relate to them, because I love them. They could be a top 15 band for me. They could be top 50. They could be around 71. It's tough because they're always interesting and I'm always impressed, but I can never really get inside and feel like I'm experiencing the things that, you know, um, Wright or Waters ever felt. I'm always just so on the outside looking in and there's just they're just so abstract and fascinating to me. I, they're never, you know, I never really feel in the moment with them, which is not a bad thing. But a lot of the music that I love makes me really feel a lot of emotions that I rarely get from Pink Floyd. And which is kind of what, like, Animals makes me really uneasy at times listening to it. And, you know, it's kind of scary in a way. But it's it's great. I love Animals. Three more to come, but this is a great one. I think that's very well articulated. And I think I kind of feel the same way. And that's probably why they're not among my very favorite bands, although I do like them a good bit. My number three is going to be Obscured by Clouds. I think a lot of people probably see this as like, you know, they were progressing album by album with Adam Hart Mother and then Metal. And then, you know, eventually you get to Dark Side. And this is kind of like maybe for some people seen as a step backwards before they take two steps forwards. But I see it as another progression towards towards their eventual greatness, where I think on metal, they're kind of perfecting things sonically and conceptually. I think on this record, they, they kind of learn how to be more concise, to pare things down, to get better at songwriting. And then I think they meld the two together perfectly on Dark Side. But I really like sort of the shorter, more to the point songwriting here. I also think this is their best sounding record up to this point. I think it's very well engineered. The gold it's in the is a uh, very unpink Floyd like. It's kind of a you know 70s hard rock tune. I love Watts uh, the deal. Uh, I think that's a fantastic song. Uh, there's great guitar playing on Mud Men. Childhood's End is like the prequel to Dark Side. 
sounds a lot like what they were moving towards. Like you said, Free 4 is, is very catchy and fun. I think Stay is an awesome tune. As a whole, these songs collectively aren't as cohesive as the next four records, but I think there's a lot of really great stuff to enjoy on this, and I think it's really underrated. I do think it's underrated, and the only thing that hold it, held it back from a much higher ranking on mine was just the too many instrumentals, really. There's just not enough kind of there. I, but I think like track for track, it's probably better than metal or a couple of the other ones maybe I, I had higher. Here's where I probably diverge from most Pink Floyd uh, listeners. And I think a lot of it has to do with just over familiarity with maybe an album. Because I have it number three, Dark Side of the Moon. I love this album. I, it's a, again, a top 100 album, but I think I've just heard it too many times. And it doesn't have that kind of like wow factor anymore for me. And I love, as much as I love, uh, I love money and I love us and them. And I think the, the closer, Eclipse, and then Brain Damage the kind of sweet the two-part sweet is maybe the best album closer ever for any album but it i just don't i never find myself listening to this album again and i don't think anyone needs me to kind of go over the intricacies and elements of it but it, it sounds fantastic it has the theme the unifying theme that pink floyd was probably missing in its earlier albums the production work is unbelievable alan parsons just Everything sounds perfect. The, the ambient noise that kind of bugged me in earlier albums doesn't annoy me on this one. It all works together. I think Money is, the solo in Money is David Gilmore's first, like great, truly great solo. The lyrics are great. The feel, the bass, everything on this album is a 10, basically. It's just, there's, there's something missing for me with this. It just never quite connected as much as the, the next two. So it's a phenomenal album, basically perfect. I'm sh probably your number ones, but uh, my number three, Dark Side of the Moon. What do you think is missing? Drugs? <laughs> Maybe on my part, yes. Fair. Well, let's do some drugs, dude, and listen to Dark Side. All right, number three. For me, great album. I have nothing bad to say about it. Wish You Were Here. Shine On You Crazy Diamond is amazing. It's it's even kind of like perfectly cut in half. Like, I think they did it great. It's a great way to start and end it. Welcome to the Sheen is really kind of haunting and awesome. Great kind of just atmosphere behind it. And Chase and Have a Cigar is one of the greatest songs of all time. And the lyrics on it are just fantastic. The satirical look, the critique of the rock industry and the capitalism behind it and the phoniness of record executives. Yeah, I don't know what the hell you were thinking. The weakest song on the album is Wish You Were Here, but it's still a great song. And it's nice chronologically to get an acoustic track back after not really having it um, on Dark Side. It it's not a huge usually conceptual album it's kind of just like a big um soulful emotional love letter to sid which is why it's nice and just kind of like a, a simple rock song like have a cigar really works um the technique is a little different here with its approach to the album making than dark side and the wall and it's just a lot more honest which you can't say you know i just talked about how it's hard to put yourself in their perspective with their emotion for their emotions but this is probably the album where you can do that the most which is why it's great so number three wish you were here wish you seen the light jason i don't dislike have a cigar i don't think it's a bad song but it's not a song that i get particularly excited to hear. Number two on my list, it was kind of a close call, but not not really, I guess. Number two for me is going to be Animals. Definitely darker, colder, more political. Definitely has a different tone than the prior Floyd records. Uh, but for me, the, the real showstopper is David Gilmore. I think it's easily his best performance on a Pink Floyd record from start to finish. So like everything he plays is amazing on this record. I do like the melodies on this record a lot too, which I, I think are really strong, especially on Pigs, three different ones. I think that's maybe the catchiest Pink Floyd song. But yeah, I just, I like it a lot. But I think sort of the dark, cold soundscape to this record is maybe what keeps it back from being number one, because I think obviously what my number one is has such a immersive sound that it's, it's, kind of undeniably great. All right. Well, again, Jason and I are in cahoots. Number two for me, Animals, which makes Wish You Were Here my number one, if you didn't know. And they're kind of mirrored opposites of each other. Like Animals is very outward looking, looking at the political landscape based on you know 1984 in a lot of ways. 
it's it has two short tracks sandwiching three really long tracks so it's kind of the opposite of which you were here which has two long tracks and three shorter ones in the middle but for me animals i mean like jason said the, the guitar work on this album is so unbelievably good uh, i believe i called it incendiary once before and i'll say it again david gilmore's guitar work on this is incendiary the things he does on sheep just incredible the, these tracks are 10, they're all 10 minutes long, uh, dogs, pigs, and sheep. And there's no weak parts of them. They all work and flow. And, you know, there's little different elements and different themes, but everyone sounds unbelievably good. The kind of s corded sliding guitar sound that David Gilmore gets on sheep kind of sounds like the guitar is breaking on it. It's just sounds and texture that you've probably never heard before. And I think this is just a showcase for him. I think water's very cold, very um, mean, unsettling lyrics. Richard Wright's keyboards kind of mirror that. They're very kind of alien sounding, very strange, other, you know, it, it doesn't almost, it doesn't sound like any other album I think ever produced, really. I guess it's regarded as the weakest of the big four, but for me, it's just, there's just something cool about it that just doesn't sound like anything else. And I think that's why hold it in such kind of high regard it's just I, I like the meanness i like the ugliness and then just david gilmore's guitar playing really just elevates it to a whole nother level yeah i i can't argue against that the guitar playing in animals is probably gilmore's best playing but i do think his guitar parts on my number two are better um that's going to be the wall before i talk about that you just referred to as the big four, and I know which four you're talking about, but man, I really want metal to be considered one of the big five. Like everyone refers to the big four, but let's make it five. Metal needs more love. Anyway, the wall, it's awesome. The guitar parts, guitar parts, guitar parts, guitar parts from Young Lust to Run Like Hell, Comfortably Numb. Those are a lot of the big radio hits, but the whole album is just so great and such a great vision. Um, You know, a big rock opera about isolation and depravity and the barriers of emotion through the symbol the wall it's deeply psychological and with dread and fear of love and self and government it's just kind of this big grandeur of exposing what can happen in your mind the best thing about it is the theater of it the characters from you know the performance and the trial is amazing and and then the other end with just like simple little things they put in like the the child in goodbye blue sky when they say look there's an airplane up in the sky everything is just so tight and just executed so well and it's just such a journey from start to finish and just incredibly enjoyable music especially with the guitar nick mason we haven't really talked much about him but he's a very underrated drummer he's very held back his best drum work will be on my number one album but it's it's pretty good here to this is waters just masterpiece flushed out and it's fantastic my number one's got to be dark side it's legendary for a reason i think every song on it is great it works as a whole cohesive like single artistic statement and the thing that really pushes it over the top for me above animals and above wish you were here and above the wall is just the way it sounds i think alan parsons who engineered the record just absolutely killed it it's one of the best sounding records that you'll ever hear chris thomas was the i think mixed it and it's just fantastic sounding i mean you can talk all day about the songs but really for me the thing that clinches it is is the way it sounds it is a fantastic sounding album and my number one is kind of the opposite to animals it's kind of very inward looking at you know Roger Waters' relationship with Sid Barrett and how he kind of disappeared and became insane and sort of a, not a love letter, but sort of a, a friend letter <laughs> to, to him. But it also has that kind of biting sarcasm that Waters would kind of cultivate later on Animals in the Wall. He's very critical of the record industry and Welcome to the Machine and Have a Cigar. And I think that really kind of elevates those two tracks just Incredible guitar part on Have a Cigar, maybe my all-time favorite solo. You know, the, the combination of the guitar riffs and the keyboards from, from Richard Wright just kind of interlacing and kind of working together is just phenomenal. I think this album, more than Dark Side, shows Gilmore's kind of importance to the band, too. I think maybe that's why I consider it, you know, in my mind better, even if it's not 
you know, considered a better album. I think Gilmore really kind of has perfected his phrasing and tone on this. And he kind of just, you know, showcases it all over the place in Shine On You Crazy Diamond, the first and the second part. And I like, you know, I've heard Wish You Were Here 10 bajillion times, but it, it's so different than kind of the rest of their catalog that it's, you know, stripped down. I love the the vocals and I love the lyrics and it's just, you know, it's a great song, even if I don't ever really have to hear it again. I like having Roy Harper sing Have a Cigar. I think that's kind of an underrated element that they basically went out and was like, hey, you sing it. You know, nobody in our band wants to do it. Let's just get somebody else to do it. And it works. He totally nails it. It fits with the element, the theme, the album. By the way, Which One's Pink is one of the great lyrics of all time. Come on, that's just beautiful. And I think it probably has my favorite synth sound ever. Maybe I just love uh, Richard Wright's sound, but I think it's just perfect on this album. It's a, a masterpiece of mood and kind of theme and just everything really just comes together uh, on this album for me. Yeah, it's a, it's a classic. Wish You Were Here, the song is my least favorite on it, but it is awesome. So I'll throw in this. I think David Gilmour has a really cool voice. I don't think he's a great singer, but I love his voice. However, I do think this is his best performance as a singer on Wish You Were Here, the song. My number one is going to be 1973's Dark Side of the Moon. The t-shirt, the album cover, everything about it is awesome. I don't have much more to say than Jason already did. I mean, uh, it works as a piece of art amazing from track to track to track. I love that they brought in, um, I can't remember the female singer on Great Gig in the Sky, but absolutely perfect casting there. It's it's perfect. You've also got just some really good guitar work and Nick Mason is the the subtle hero of this album with the jazz influence that kind of brings everything together for me. The highlight is the production and the mixing and the engineering Jason's right. So yeah, me and Jason's favorite album and many people's, a lot of people's favorite album of all time, Dark Side of the Moon, which kind of segues nicely. Um, If you're watching this, tune in on Friday because that's got to be a strong contender for 1973 album of the year. Any closing thoughts on Pink Floyd, guys? Did you come in with a certain idea or end up like a more or less or what's the deal because i've got a couple closing statements but go ahead you know i knew their later half of their discography kind of starting from dark side i never really delved too deep in the rest of it it's some some interesting stuff it's nothing you know i didn't find anything where i was like whoa this is my new favorite album of all time or anything but it is definitely kind of a worthwhile trip and they have a lot more than just the songs that you've heard on the radio i think i like them about the same that I did going into this, although I, I think it did shed some light on like some different things that I didn't really maybe realize. I don't think I realized how sort of different The Wall was from the rest of their catalog. Yeah, so like I, I feel different ways about some albums, but my overall opinion of Pink Floyd as a whole is, is about the same. Yeah, I kind of touched on that earlier about where um, I have a hard time placing them as an all-time artist for me. But I don't think it's gone up or down. The only album that I hadn't really listened to before or I mean, I'm positive I had never listened to more or uh, Amagama, um, and I won't ever again, probably. And, and I will t- say this, the time the time of us doing this and recording this in mid-summer, they're not a summer band. So I think that kind of played off of it. I think I would probably give them a little bit more love if, it, if we were doing this in the fall or winter. So maybe I'm affected seasonally a little bit about, but they're definitely not a summer band to me. I'd rather be in, you know, a cold, dark, car driving home listening to welcome to the machine than anything else so but i definitely love them they're great so thanks everybody for tuning in let us know what your list of the pink void albums are and don't forget to like comment subscribe and hit the bell for notifications i'm cramser on listography and we will see you next time 